Welcome to Chapel of the Cross online service. We are so glad that you joined us today to worship our great God in these unprecedented times. We are going to be having communion at the end of the sermon. So we just want you to take a moment, if you haven't already, to prepare the elements, gather some juice, gather some bread, have them ready so that you can partake with us. In addition, if you are joining us as a family and you have children who are sitting in on our sermon today, we have prepared sermon notes for kids on our website. If you go to chapelcares.com slash online, you may download those and print them off and have them ready so your kids can follow along and be engaged in the sermon. We have other things available on that website as well, including our weekly schedule. It includes all of the things that our students are doing with Ignite at 4.30. They have a daily time where they, they just talk about what they're reading in God's word, as well as their virtual Ignite on Wednesday evenings, and they're going to have some other things as well. So uh, we would love for you to join us all week long as we continue to just seek after God's heart during this time. We pray that you and your family are staying safe, that you are staying healthy, and that you are staying close to him. Let's pray together as we begin. God, we thank you so much for this time that we can worship a God who loves us, a God who cares for us, a God who has sent his one and only son for us. We can't gather right now as a community of believers in our church building, but we are gathered here around a computer screen or a TV screen. Lord, you have allowed us to have this technology to just come together virtually to worship you. And I pray, God, that you will be honored and glorified today as we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.
teach you guys a new song. And this is kind of the perfect platform for this, if you think about it. And um, so this song was written, this next song, um, it's called I Will Not Be Shaken. And it was written by a dear friend of mine. Um, he was my pastor for a while and, uh, and a mentor to me. And when we actually studied at uh, Southeastern University down in Florida together. And we met up in a, in, a, in a dingy old practice piano room. And he brought these lyrics. And I sat down at the piano, and we kind of um, put this together. And it's really a song of joy and of um, declaration. And so I'm going to teach you this song. And we'll have the words for you so you can join along as well. But um, I hope this blesses you. I will not be shaken. I will not be moved. I will lift my to put our faith in you, God, and um, help us to really hear from you. Uh, help us to hear from you this morning or whenever we're listening to this, Lord. You are in control. You love us, and you have a word to speak to us, God, and help us to, to really listen. Amen. Well, if you haven't figured it out by now, life is very unpredictable. This life that God has given us to live on this planet is uh, ever-changing. It's full of great joy great exhilaration, but also times of disappointment and, and confusion. Most of us would not have predicted uh, that a virus would hit us in, in 2020 and, um, 
and, and basically wipe out our ability to meet in person together in a relational way. But it's okay. Whatever God brings and allows, uh, we can withstand. And one thing is for sure, in the midst of all the craziness, the fears, the instability, the change, uh, God doesn't move or change who he is. And God has given us something stable, something wonderful, actually someone wonderful, his name is Jesus. And now more than ever, it's very, very important that we learn who he is, that we understand the reality of his nature, and we embrace all of the good things that he has done for us through his life, his death on the cross, his resurrection. So we're talking about some of those things today. I'm asking who is Jesus? The basic short answer, uh, the end of the story is Jesus is God. And now we're gonna talk about him being God uh, today. Let me pray. Father, thank you so much for allowing us uh, this time to gather. I know we're in different places, Father, but we're united in spirit. Uh, Jesus, that being united, being family together is only made possible by, by what you've done for us. And we just wanna say we love you. We can't thank you for your sacrifice, your love, your gift of grace and forgiveness. Holy Spirit, speak to us now and allow us the ability to understand your word for without the objective reality of the Bible, we would really have trouble understanding who you are and how to relate to you. So thanks for giving us the word. Speak to us now in Jesus name, amen. Who is Jesus? Well, we believe Jesus is God. We live in a society though that basically says all truth is the same, it doesn't matter. In fact, it's bad if we have differences. It isolates certain types of groups and peoples. So one of the things that I, I thought would be interesting for you is to explain who is Jesus uh, and how is he represented by the main religious groups uh, that are in our world uh, today. I understand that these are snapshots. I know uh, that these are very brief summaries. It's impossible to, to get all of the intricacies of different kinds of beliefs. So the, I mean, no offense, I'm just summarizing the different nature of religious belief and who Jesus is. For the Jewish people, Jesus, was an admirable Jew, a teacher, but not the son of God. To the nation of Islam, Jesus was a great prophet who was born miraculously, but who did not die, nor was he resurrected. If you're part of the Hindu uh, religion, Jesus was a virtuous man, devoted to compassion and nonviolence. However, his devotion to a single God is unnecessarily restrictive. If you come from a Buddhist background, uh, Jesus is a depersonalized type of Buddha or a perfectly enlightened being who helps others attain enlightenment. But for biblical Christianity, this is what we believe. He is God. He died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin and he was raised from the dead to conquer sin and death. When you study some other historical documents too, uh, people have different ideas about the importance of Jesus. But I love the quote by Kenneth Scott Lateretta, historian that says, as the centuries pass, the evidence is accumulating that measured by his effect on history, Jesus is the most influential life ever lived on this planet. The influence appears to be mounting that things center around him. He said that in 1949. And years ago, a famous skeptic uh, science fiction writer H.G. Wells, perhaps you've heard of him, he says, I'm a historian, I'm not a believer, but I must confess as a historian, the penniless creature from Galilee is irresistibly the center of all history. It matters what you believe about who Jesus is. We are distinct in our belief that he is God, that he was resurrected from the dead and some other things that we will go through. It's okay to have differences in society. In fact, if you enjoy anything about tolerance and, and, and being tolerant of other people and beliefs, by definition, tolerance means that you believe different things. Otherwise, it wouldn't matter. If you believe the same things, there's no need for a word called tolerance. So let's start with some basics. Who did Jesus claim to be? There's a great story where he's interacting with uh, the religious uh, people of the day, the Jewish leaders in John chapter eight. And he is talking about who he is. And they're wondering, is this guy demon possessed? Is he, uh, is he out of his mind? Is he crazy? He says this in verse 58 of John eight. He says, I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, 
I am. Now this I am seems like an innocent little phrase, but what it refers back to is in, in Exodus 3 when, when uh, God was revealing his divine name to Moses. Remember Moses was gonna lead the people out of Egypt. And, and he said, in case they ask your name, God, who can I tell them you are? And he says, I am who I am. In the Greek, it means ego I me. And it's basically, I am and I've always been, I've always existed, I'm the uncaused cause. It's almost like a, a humorous answer. Why are you even asking? Because I am the greatest of all time. I am God, I have always been and I will always exist. When Jesus says this statement, he is identifying himself with God the Father very clearly. He goes on in a, in a verse in Matthew, Matthew chapter eight, to uh, call himself the son of man. Matthew chapter eight, verse 20 says this. Jesus replied when he was asked about what it means to follow him. Jesus replied, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. He's describing himself uh, it's a common name for the perfect man, the perfect savior, also equal to the son of God in the description in other parts of, 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 of the New Testament. He's basically equating himself with God and saying, I am divine. I am that son that you have waited for, that Messiah, uh, that anointed one that was gonna save Israel and then for the world from all of their sins. He also claims to be equal with the father in John 14. John 14, starting in verse five. Let me just read just a little bit here for you. Thomas said to him, uh, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? He said earlier, I'm going to prepare a place for you in heaven. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Remember when I was talking about there's differences in what we believe? That's a difference. Jesus is the only way to have access to a relationship with God. If you really knew me, you would know my father as well. From now on, you do know me and you have seen him. Basically he's saying, if you look at me, that's who God is. We are equal in essence. Sure, we have our own divine presence. The Trinity makes that clear. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But Jesus is equal in importance. He is God. He also claimed divine authority for himself. In Matthew 28, in some of the closing words that Jesus gave uh, to his disciples, he said this, Matthew 28, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I don't know if you've noticed this before, but in the New Testament, Jesus uses, I am the way, me, my personal pronouns. He's not pointing to a distant philosophy. He's pointing directly uh, to himself. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples the marching order for the church. Another interesting thing that sort of kind of gives evidence that Jesus believed he was God was he accepted worship. Only a God would be crazy enough to let someone bow down and worship them. In John chapter nine, flipping back to where we started, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when, when he found him, he says, do you believe in the son of man? Basically he had cured a, a blind man and uh, this blind man was being questioned and, and the Jewish leaders did depreciate uh, that this miracle had been performed. So they were being kind of mean to him. They'd thrown him out of the presence and says, do you believe in the son of man? And the guy answers, who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. And Jesus says plainly, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking to you. Then the man said, Lord, I do believe. And he worshiped him. He praised him for clearly being God and healing him miraculously. One of the last things that uh, sort of backs up Jesus' claims is he forgave sins. Um, uh, Mark chapter two is a, is a great story. And I wish I could spend more time with you going through all these stories of the great things that Jesus ha has done for us. But uh, in Mark two, he says this in verse five. It says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Basically, there's a huge crowd. People wanted access to Jesus. At this time, they didn't understand that he was the anointed Messiah. But basically, they figured out a way to lower this guy down into Jesus' presence through a hole in the roof. And, 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 and he was just so overtaken uh, by their faith. He said, son, your sins are forgiven. And some teachers of the law says this, why does this fellow talk like this? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? That's why he's saying it, because he is 
God. The great biblical scholar and and writer, C.S. Lewis, says this uh, about the person of Jesus and his divinity, him being God. Says, now unless the speaker is God, this is really so preposterous as to be comic. For we all understand how a man forgives offenses against himself. You tread on my toe and I forgive you. You steal my money and I forgive you. But what should we make of a man himself unrobed and untrodden on who announced that he forgave you for the treading on another man's toes and stealing another man's money? It's asinine at best is the kindest description that I could give of his conduct. Yet this is what Jesus did. He told people that their, li- that their sins were forgiven and never waited to consult on the other people whom their sins had undoubtedly injured. He unhesitantly behaved as if he was the party chiefly concerned, the person chiefly offended in all offenses. This makes sense only if he really was the son of God, whose laws are broken and whose love is wounded in every sin. In the mouth of any speaker who is not God, these words would imply that I can only regard as silliness unrivaled uh, by this crazy character in history if he's not God. And he is. So Jesus claimed to be God. Other people uh, authenticated Jesus as God as they walked through life and ministry. We have an example of the Jewish leaders clearly understanding what he's saying about Jesus being God. Turn to Luke 22. I know I'm asking you to turn a little bit, but they're only like two or three books together. So hopefully you're hanging with me and and not not getting too lost. Luke 22, uh, starting in verse 66. So as at daybreak, the elders of the people, both the chief priests and the teachers of the law met together and Jesus was led before them. If you are the Christ, they said, tell us. Jesus answered, if I tell you, you will not believe me. And if I asked you, you would not answer. But from now on, the son of man, remember that word that I gave you, that phrase that he's referring to himself as God. And now on the son of man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. They all ask, are you then the son of God? He replied, you are right in saying that I am. Again, those two words that are so important. Then they said, why do we need uh, any more testimony? Let's, let's go ahead and, and get rid of him, crucify him, because we have heard it from his own lips. He's blaspheming, which is a cardinal sin, punishable by death for anyone that made those claims. So the Jewish leaders clearly understood. They didn't believe it, but they understood. The Apostle Paul also gives us context of uh, who he thinks God is is through his son, Jesus Christ. In the book of Hebrews, chapter one, these words are incredible. Listen to these words. It says, in the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through him made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels and all other beings before or after him. Paul claims that if you want to know what God's like, look at Jesus. Jesus is God and it was authenticated by these groups of people. Probably the most important evidence that I can give you that Jesus is God, though, is around how did Jesus demonstrate that he's God in his life. As he walked the human life like like we do, he entered humanity on our behalf to live perfectly in humanity and those kinds of things to help us understand who God is. How did he demonstrate that? The first is this. He lived a sinless life. He didn't commit a sin. Can you uh, can you imagine I mean, I, I could say maybe I don't behave sinfully sometimes, but if you understood my thoughts, you would know that I'm a sinful person. And the more I try to control my thoughts, the more I get stuck on certain things and it just spins around and perseverates and gets worse. I am sinful and broken and so are you. Jesus didn't have these problems. He was human and he understood them, uh, but he didn't have them. John chapter eight, verse 46. Jesus is arguing for his position of who he is. He's arguing with the Jews and he says this, can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I'm telling the truth, why don't you believe me? He's basically saying, show me what I've done wrong. Show me the sin that's in my life. And they couldn't come up with anything. He was fully human. He was that perfect sacrifice for our sins. He didn't sin, but he died for our sins, the sins that we have committed. And only God could do that for us. 
He also performed miracles. Uh, Luke chapter nine. There's so many awesome miracles that I could show you and talk with you about, but I picked this one because it was just kind of stunning in its, uh, in its makeup. Luke chapter nine, verse one. It says, when Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal them and to heal the sick. He said, take nothing with you for this journey, but yourselves. When you go, you have the ability and the power to heal sin, right? He goes on and then he talks about uh, this man that was born uh, blind from birth and he has an encounter with him and he spits and, and, and makes some clay uh, with his own spittle and he rubs it in his eyes. He says, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And they, when he did, this man that could see nothing, could see nothing from birth on, he had no idea what color was like, what images, what people look like and, and, and the pictures that, he could, that other people worship and love and art and that kind of stuff, he had nothing. And he washed and he was forgiven for his sin and he was blind and now he sees. Those are, it's just a wonderful example of what, what Jesus did. And these are all recorded in the New Testament for you to look at. He also had power over death. He had power over death. John chapter 11. We have this great story of his friend Lazarus that dies. And everyone was very sad that he had died. They tried to get Jesus to come earlier, but he was pretty busy. So uh, when he finally showed up, he was trying to calm people down and Luke I'm sorry, John 11, verse 25, he said this, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? He was trying to say, I have power over death. Death is the constant enemy of us all. It's brought up even more with this virus and these kinds of things. We, we panic, we fear it. It's something that's out there for all of us and we can't take it away. But he goes on and says in verse 41, so when they took Jesus away, they looked up at him and said, Father, I thank you, thank you that you have heard me. He's going to bring Lazarus back to life to show that he has that power, right? I thank you, you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me when I pray, but I said this so that other people could benefit from what I'm saying, standing here and that they might believe that you sent me, God. When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. This come out is such a powerful, almost screaming phrase of demand and asking God to do something in a miraculous way. And guess what? The dead man came out, his hands and feet were wrapped in strips of linen and cloth around his face. He says, take off your grave, grave clothes and let him go. It was amazing. He brought someone back from the dead. He also was personally resurrected from the dead. In Luke 24, uh, we have evidence of this. After he died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, he was buried. He was raised on the third day. We celebrate that in Easter coming up soon. Um, we learn in verse 44 of Luke 24. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written in, about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened up their minds so that they could understand scriptures. And he told them, this is what is written, that Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. And you're gonna be my witnesses of these things. These are powerful claims. Uh, these are things, by the way, that no other religious uh, leader and philosopher in history have ever done. His resurrection, uh, the miracles, his power over death, him being raised from the dead. It's just an amazing thing to do. So. Lee Strobel once said that if you, if you claim to be the president of the United States, for example, you're crazy unless you actually are the president. People said Jesus is crazy, but he was actually God. He controlled these things. He did these things in a way to demonstrate his power and that he is the only truth that matters. He died for us. Years ago, I was uh, at a conference and I heard a pastor from San Diego describe the death of Jesus for our sins in a very unique way. This pastor had a son that had some special needs, but he loved baseball. And he was a pretty good baseball player, but he was always losing his hat. And so at this particular time, there was a game going on. His son would get stressed out if he couldn't find stuff. He was throwing a fit. 
He didn't have his hat. The dad, who was the pastor, got mad and said, get in the car, you'll be fine. The son's screaming. They dropped him off at the field. He had to go to work, and he was going to catch him after the game because he had some important stuff to do at the church. When he got back to the game, he noticed his son was wearing a hat, and he couldn't understand where it came from. Maybe somebody found it. Maybe somebody borrowed it. And then he looked over at the coach who was bald, and he was completely sunburned on the top of his head. What had happened is, is the coach had given him his hat of protection. And that's what Jesus has done for us. He walked into humanity. He lived and he died in such a painful, awful way to prove not only that he is God, but he can be that hat, that protector, that that divine grace that will help us in all of our lives. So what do you think? Jesus is God. It's pretty basic, right? Here's the deal. It's not enough just to know who he is. You have to respond to who he is. You have to come to a point of decision. So let me ask you, do you believe that Jesus is God? Do you believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? There is no forgiveness apart from him. Are you willing to make a choice to follow him? You cannot just know about this stuff without volitionally choosing to put your trust in who who he is by willingly putting the hat on, so to speak, with that illustration that I gave you. You must choose to believe. If you don't choose, you're basically saying no. You're basically saying, no, I don't believe that he is God and he is not relevant in my life. A great scholar by the name of William Barclay said these words, either what Jesus said about himself is false, in which case he is guilty of such blasphemy as no man dared ever to utter, or what he said about himself is true, in which case he is what he claimed to be and can be described in no other terms than the son of God. Jesus leaves us with a definite choice. We must either accept him fully or reject him absolutely. This is precisely why every person has to decide for or against Jesus Christ. It's my hope and prayer that you have decided for him. I've given you a lot of scriptures, but don't, and I talk really fast. I actually think it's a spiritual gift, so don't let that bother you. Just learn to listen quickly, right? So, um, I gave you all these scriptures, but they're in the study guides. The reason why we put these study guides together is so you can ask questions and study this stuff with your family and your friends and those kinds of things. Read more of the verses that I just sort of so quickly uh, skimmed through and realize that uh, Jesus is God and that there is no other God but him. He's the one and truly only absolute God. And I hope that you have placed your faith and trust in him. And if you have, you're like me, that you've known Jesus for a while I hope that the knowledge of him being God, being in control, knowing what's going on, being able to have divine authority over everything. Like I didn't even go into the story where Jesus calmed the water. What kind of man actually speaks to the water and the water obeys him? I was on a ferry ride one time from Victoria Island to Port Angeles, Washington State. In this strait, the waves get really rough and we were there with my family and the boat was rocking so much that we were falling over and some of us were getting sick and those kinds of things. We just wanted the boat to stop and I cried out for it to stop. Guess what happened? Nothing, absolutely nothing. Why? I am not God and neither are you. There is only one Jesus. He is your way to find salvation and forgiveness and hope especially in this time of frightening things like the virus and that kind of stuff. So just want to mention those things to you. I hope you'll read them. I hope you'll have the deep conviction and make the choice to place your faith in Jesus, to receive him into your life if you haven't done so. And uh, may God bless you and continue to hold him close to your heart as, as we go through this season uh, together. Let me, let me pray for you. Father, thank you uh, for your love, for your grace, for the clear expression of the identity of Jesus being God in scripture. Father, we don't worship you through subjectivity or just emotions. We worship you through the promises and, and, the, and the declarations that are in the Bible. We believe uh, that it's true and it guides us to faith in you and you alone for forgiveness of sin. You alone for a hope for a future. You alone for courage and boldness to live in this life that is so ever-changing and unpredictable. Father, we love you. We love you for giving us Jesus. Jesus, we can't say we love you enough uh, because of what you've done for us. The things that you had to go through and you didn't do anything wrong. It just overwhelms me that you love us that much to die and to give your life for us that way. And Holy Spirit, thanks for bringing the word alive and giving us scripture that we can understand. May we apply it to our lives. May we grow strength 
uh, during this season where, yes, we are isolated, but we're not alone. Uh, you're with us, God, and we're with each other in spirit. Keep, uh, keep us safe. I pray for those that uh, are in our congregation that I pray that they'd be, they wouldn't get sick, that you would help them uh, get past this virus with no complications, and that uh, we'd be okay together and we'd worship together someday soon. So we love you again, and we ask you to bless us and help us live out the truth that you are God. And maybe declare that to someone else as we walk through maybe emails and internet types of conversations and stuff. Uh, you are the truth, and, and we need to believe in you. It's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. a time of communion, so whatever you have prepared, uh, some sort of bread and some sort of cup, um, uh, if you could have that ready, uh, even though we're uh, not physically in the same building, uh, we're still part of the same church, we're still part of the same church family, um, and we do this uh, in remembrance uh, that Jesus was God, and that because he was God, um, he died on the cross uh, for our forgiveness, and that's what represents. And we do this. Um, I ask God to forgive me like every single day. I know that I, it's not like I screw up once and like, oh, it's all gone. But I still just remind myself, like I still ask God, I still go through the motions, please God forgive me, please God forgive me. It just gives me reassurance. And so that's the time to do this. And it only makes sense to ask Jesus to forgive you if he was God. And so that's a time to, to stop um, as a family, as a church family, So I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to read some words um, from Jesus. Uh, this is in Luke chapter 22. So this is from the very last meal that Jesus had uh, with, his, uh, with his closest friends, his disciples. So this is literally Jesus' last meal. So let's pray for communion. Jesus, I pray that you bless this time. Thank you uh, for setting up this ordinance. Thank you for setting this up and establishing this tradition that Christians have done for thousands and thousands of years. And thank you that it's meaningful because we believe in you, because we have the Holy Spirit. Um, and we are able to do this now as a church family. Uh, please bless this communion. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you.
Jesus, thank you again. I pray that this time of communion and prayer and worship just encourages us. Thank you that we get a chance to do this. I just pray that it's something that we look forward to, maybe a reminder of our church family uh, now and in the future. May it remind us that we have a heavenly home where there is no, there's no mourning, there's no tears, there's no disease. Just give us a reminder, Holy Spirit, remind us in a real, genuine way. that you joined us uh, continue to remember us in your thoughts and prayers and uh, if you can remember to give I know it's sort of a, a strange thing to remind you of but when we're not present together sometimes we forget and uh, we still are asking God to take care of all the needs that we have while, while we're apart so you can go online or you can uh, give uh, through the mail whatever you might want to do we really appreciate it let me bless you out Father thank you uh, for your love and your grace and your mercy thank you for giving us your provision yourself Jesus is God. He forgives us. He died for us. He has power over the things that scare us the most, like death. Thank you for what you're doing in our lives. May we trust you with all things. Keep everyone safe. And we look forward to that day when we can be back together. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. And take care of yourself. And we'll talk to you soon.